All right, so in section 9.1, we looked at sequences. And I told you it was kind of a unique section that introduces us to this chapter. Um, everything else we do after this are going to be series. So today we're starting with series and convergence. So definition. Um, if we have an infinite sequence, a sub n, then if we take the summation from n equal 1 to infinity of a sub n, right, we add them up forever, that's an infinite series. Or for the sake of what we're doing, we're just going to call it a series. All of ours are going to be infinite. Okay. The numbers, a1, a2, and so forth, are called the terms of the series. All right, so for the series, the summation from n equal 1 to infinity of a sub n, the nth partial sum is defined to be capital S sub n, which is adding up the terms from a sub 1 to a sub n. So it's the finite series associated with those first n terms. But when we say series, we're going to be talking about something infinite. If the sequence of partial sums converges, then the series converges. And they converges to something we call, we'll call S. So the limit S is the sum of the series. So it's a sub 1 all the way up to infinity, right? Which is the summation from n equal 1 n equal 1 to infinity of a sub n. If the sequence s sub n diverges, then the series diverges. So there is a connection between series convergence and sequences convergence, but it's the sequence of the partial sums we're talking about. So we're going to spend the majority of the rest of our time in this chapter addressing whether a series converges or diverges. And if it converges, what does it converge to? What's its sum? These questions are much more difficult than they were for sequences. The second question is especially hard, and sometimes it's not even possible to find. Sometimes the best we can do is say it converges, but I still don't know what it converges to. Okay. Crazy, yeah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen real fast, too. We're going to encounter that, I think, is in 9.3. Now, the ones that we're going to do today, we're going to be able to find the summation. Um, not only that, but it's something you've probably seen before, um, maybe in an Algebra 2 class um, or something like that. Um, so we're going to take a look at um, a geometric series. So when we have sequences of the form a times r to the n, and we take its summation from a equal or from n equal one to infinity, so we have a plus a r plus a r squared plus a r cubed. This is a geometric series with ratio r, and r can't be zero. R can be positive, r can be negative, fractions, decimals, whatever you like, but not zero. And in particular, if we have a geometric series, it will either converge or diverge. And we know exactly when which will happen. So if the r value, the absolute value, is greater than or equal to 1, it's going to diverge. And if it's between, the absolute value is between 0 and 1, it's going to converge. And it converges to a over 1 minus r. Have you seen that equation before? I know I had seen that one in high school before I encountered it in a calculus course. If you haven't, it's okay. <coughs> seen it? Now, it's only going to work if the r value is between 0 and 1. So you can't just use this formula whenever you'd like. It will only work and be the summation, right? Find the summation if the summation exists. And the summation will actually, or if it converges. And it will only converge if we're between 0 and 1 on the r value. If we're not, it's just not, it's going to give us a value, sure, but it's not going to actually be the value that we're, we're thinking we found. So determining whether or not this is going to work hinges on two things. Number one, you have to identify that you really have a geometric series. 
got to make sure you make sure it really fits the definition, right? And the second thing is simply looking at what the R value is. And then we know. So we're going to take a look at an example. So this one says we're going to find the sum of the convergent series. It tells us that it converges. But let's do the, our, our due diligence in identifying that it really is geometric. So why is this geometric? Look back at the form. Okay, that's why it converges and, and, um, before that. Yeah. So before, he's, you're exactly right. That's why it's going to converge is because the R value is, the absolute value is between 0 and 1. But why is it geometric? I'm going to write down the general form of it back up here. Because there's an exponent? There is a power on this R value, and we have a coefficient in front. Notice there's no addition or subtraction, right, inside of there. I don't have rational functions, I don't have anything of that going on. There's no logs or sines and cosines. I don't have anything. It fits the definition. It's a constant, namely 1 half, and it's times the value that's raised to a power. That's what makes it geometric. It's got the right form. Now, just like you had mentioned, the R value is negative one-third, absolute value of negative one-third. This is between zero and one, right? So because of this, it's going to converge as well. It's geometric because it fits the profile, right? And then it converges because it has this condition with it that, that, that uh, plays out. So what that means is that we're able to do a over 1 minus r for our sum. So what's my a value? 1 half. What's my r value? Negative 1 third. Make sure we've got the negative. It matters in finding the summation, right? So now we have 1 half divided by, I've got 1 plus 1 third, right? So what's that going to give me? Four thirds. So show as middle, little as much as you'd like in terms of finding the value uh, in terms of steps. What is our sum? Three eighths. So we have an infinite sequence with a finite sum. And that's kind of a strange feeling to be able to even say. Something that is infinite created a finite sum, okay? So this is geometric series. What would need to be true in order, oh wait, did I have it down there? There it was. What would need to be true or would be different about the above series for it to diverge? R was more than greater. If R was greater than or equal to one. Greater than or equal to one or actually we could say less than or equal to negative one, or you could put in the absolute values if you'd like. Yeah, so we need a value for r, uh, and I'm glad you said equal to, because it can equal one. If it equals one, that's, that's a very unexciting geometric series, by the way, right? One to any power is just one. But you could imagine if you added something together like this a sub, um, the a value is one half. So if you added one half plus one half plus one half plus, if you added that infinite times, of course it's going to diverge. That's the equivalent to having the R value equal to one. So yeah, if we have either of those features happening um, and with our R value, this series would diverge. All right, our second type of series we're going to look at today is called a telescoping or collapsing series. This one's very interesting as well. Um, so it's a type of series where the partial sums are used and terms cancel out. It's not always easy to identify just by looking at the sequence when it's given to us. You might get better at it over time, but it's still easier to actually see this happening by writing some terms out. And what you'll notice is things start to cancel out. Okay, so we have the summation from k equal one to infinity of one over k times k plus one. Where are we going to start on this? We're actually going to start with something you did in Calc 2. You may or may not have liked very much. It's not even a Calc 2 topic. It's just the first time you need it, so it's usually the first time you encounter it. 
It was called partial fractions. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. No. Yes. Okay, we'll see. All right, here's how partial fractions work. It's actually a college algebra topic, to be honest. Did you know that? It's in college algebra textbooks. Uh, but it's rarely ever gotten to because Calc 2 is the first time people use it for anything. Kind of crazy. All right, so here's the way partial fractions works. We have 1 over k times k plus 1. I'm going to write that to start with. And we start by separating this out based on the fact that we have a denominator that's being multiplied. So that mo denominator being multiplied would be able to come from two fractions that were added together with individual denominators that are the factors of that one. So this is k and k plus 1. All right, so if I had two fractions with a denominator k and k plus 1 and I wanted to merge them into a single fraction, I would find a common denominator, and that common denominator would be k times k plus 1. Does that make sense so far? Okay. I need to get the numerators to make this work. And I don't know what they are, so I arbitrarily just call them a and b for now. And then what I actually do is I try to put them back together into a single fraction and see what happens. So I take my first one, first one and I multiply it by k plus 1, top and bottom. And I do the denominator by k, top and bottom. So that will end up giving me on top a k plus a plus b k over k times k plus 1. Okay, so far so good. Now, the fraction I started with, the 1 over k times k plus 1, and the fraction that I ended with are the same. They just look different. So I need to figure out how to compare the numerators to see what in the world are a and b. So the reality is that the a and the b could be separated out. Um, let me actually rewrite that differently. I'll get to that in a second. Let me write this. I've got a plus b times k, and I've got a. So I'm going to group together the linear terms and group together the constant terms. Is that all right? Okay, now notice over here on the left-hand side, I don't have any k's in the numerator, right? There, there aren't any. So this coefficient in front of k here has to be 0, because it doesn't exist in the fraction on the left. It's just not there. So this right here has to equal 0. And this would be the only thing left, would have to equal the 1 that's actually in the numerator of my original fraction. And that's really nice because we just figured out what A is. So if A is 1, what's B? Negative 1. Negative 1, right? And if it were more complicated, if there were more pieces, or you were trying to do, do you can set up a system of equations. Right, where you can say, oh, like let's say the left-hand side didn't just have 1 in the numerator. Let's say it had k plus 2 in the numerator. It could do that, right? And then I'd actually have a coefficient that had a k, a piece that had k in it, and a piece of the coefficient or the, x, the numerator that had the constant in it. And it'd have to make more comparisons. So I would actually set up that 0 is equal to a plus b, and that 1 is equal to a in our case. And because that happens, this tells us, of course, that the b value is negative 1. So my fraction that I've been manipulating with over here, the two fractions, actually have numerators of 1 and negative 1. So I have 1 over k plus, sorry, minus, um, because it's negative, so then we have minus 1 over k plus 1. So telescoping series always end up looking like this at the end. You have two fractions that are very, very similar. Notice the denominators, one's bigger, one denominator is bigger than the other one. That's the only difference. And it doesn't have to be just one bigger. It could be two bigger or three bigger, and it would still fit the criteria for it to be telescoping. So what do I mean by it being telescoping? Well, we're going to write out some of these terms. So what I created now is I'm looking at the summation from k equal 1 to infinity. And my new expression is going to say 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. And we're going to write some terms out. So if, I, if k is 1, this is 1. I'm actually going to write them in fraction form for now. 1, half, 1 
over 1 minus 1 half. That's my first term. Agreed? I don't want to reduce them and combine them. That's completely unhelpful. Okay? We want to leave them in their pieces. The second one. Well, if I put in the number 2, I have 1 half minus 1 third. What happens if I put in 3? Yep, I have 1 third minus 1 fourth. We'll write one more out. What will be 1 fourth minus 1 fifth? And the process will continue. Okay, I'm out of my screen, so I guess the process will scoot over. Okay. Okay, is that good? Do you see some things falling apart? Terms cancel when I have telescoping series. They don't necessarily have to be terms that are right beside each other. This one is, right? The negative one half and the positive one half. And I have negative one third and I have positive one third. And I have negative one fourth and I have positive one fourth. And they always cancel out and this goes on infinitely. So they all cancel out except for the first one, which is the number one. So this ends up giving me the number one. So this one is telescoping because of the cancellation of these numbers as we go, you know, piecewise all the way along. Um, if this had said uh, like one over K minus one over K plus three, They'd start canceling out, but you'd have some pieces that would remain more than just one of them. So you don't necessarily just have the first piece that remains when you have a telescoping series. But eventually, they start to cancel one another out when you write them out far enough. Yes? So if that were the case, if it was like K plus 3, mm -hmm. said, yep. I mean, it should still be 1? No, it'd be whatever pieces didn't cancel. So you'd probably have, if you did K plus 3, you'd have, I think you'd have three pieces that would remain, and you just add those three pieces together. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So this actually allows us to do some arithmetic stuff in a little bit different way than um, you've possibly done it before. So here is our example. We're going to write the repeating decimal as a geometric series. And then we're going to write it as the ratio of two integers. Now you probably know what the answer is from sort of some shortcut stuff you've seen before for what the ratio of this is as integers, right? A ratio of integers, like a fraction. Do you know what 0.36 repeating is in fractional form? Okay, how did you get that? Uh, well, just kind of um, in the 11, I, I don't know, I just kind of knew it from um, just kind of thinking like 99 is close to 100, so 11 kind of follows a pattern of as you go, like, up to okay, okay. And a lot of times people will know that this could be written, uh, when you have a repeating decimal, written this way as being over 99. 36 divided by 99. Now, that only works because the 3 and the 6 are both repeated. Like, everything after the decimal is repeated. So, like, in the courses that you were talking about before, Maggie, I teach this, but not this way in my um, proportional and statistical reasoning class. And we talk about how to change this into fractional form there. So we're going to use calculus to change this into fractional form. So you can see how this would work. And then it'll work for more complicated decimal expansions, too, that we're not, you know, this, this, that this one isn't. Um, but we're first going to write this as a ratio, or first we're going to write this as a repeating decimal, I'm sorry, as a geometric series. That's the words I want, as a geometric series. So we're going to start with part A. So what I'd like for you to take a look at when you're doing this is that this is a 3-6 that keeps repeating, right? right that, that's what it really means uh, when we write down the 3-6 with the bar on top. And so there's a 36 in each of the place values, every other place value that follows. For example, I have 36 hundredths, and that's my first 36. Right? This first 36 is in the hundredths place, so it's 36 hundredths. And then the next 36 is in what place value? 10 thousandths, right? It's a 10 thousandths place. And then the next 36 is in? Yep, the 1 millionths place. So we're increasing it by two zeros every time, right? That's probably enough for what we're looking at. Um, part of this remains the same. In every term, we have 36. 
So in terms of our geometric series notation, 36 is my a sub n, or my a at the beginning, not a sub n, but my a in that form. We'll go with k. But this over, you know, powers of 10 business changes every time. Um, you can express this if you want as powers of 10, and that works just fine. Um, but I think maybe it's a little bit easier to see that these are powers of 100 because every single time I'm multiplying by something that gets two zeros longer, right? So this one is 100 to the 1, and this one is 100 squared, and this one is 100 cubed. So these are powers of 100. You could do it powers of 10 if you wish. If you do it with powers of 10, then you end up with exponents that aren't just n. They're like 2n or 2k. So I have the number, I'll put it as the denominator. You could write it to the side if you want. Actually, you know what, let me do it that way since we've got it written that way. So I have 100 here, and it's to the power n. Um, sometimes you need to be, really, be a little bit careful that the k value is really starting with 1. Um, if you look back at our definition of a geometric series, it starts with k or n equal to something specific, and we have to make sure that it actually works every time. So if you flip back over there, it says in theorem 9-6, the sum goes from n equal 1 to infinity. So sometimes we have to do some resetting of the first term to account for that series. Um, in particular, not because we're trying to show whether um, or not because we're trying to say whether it converges or diverges, because that's irrelevant to whether it converges or diverges, but the formula a over 1 minus r is specifically for when n is set at the beginning to n equal 1 to infinity. So we have to be a little bit careful in that. Okay, so this is one version of it um, that we would have for our geometric series. I think it's a pretty good one based on the things that we've been discussing. So we'll leave it there. Um, uh, let's see. I think there may be a typo, just a second. Okay, just so it's on, my, my volume's back on now, so it's catching me too. There is a typo back in my geometric series. Let's all fix it together. This should say n equal to zero to infinity. These should all be defined from n equal to zero. I'll fix them on the notes that are posted later. They should say n equal to zero to infinity. Okay, so back to the one we were doing then. Ours currently is starting at n equal to, or so k equal, ours is k k equal 1 to infinity, and we need it to be able to start at k equals 0 to infinity. Yes? Is the n supposed to be k, or is that... Uh, it's supposed to be k. Thank you. Yes. Ks and ns are used um, in different textbooks. I don't know what your uses as its default, but I've used both, so now I'm interchanging them. Um, all right. So there's a couple of things that we could do to get this summation, which we're about to do in part B. Um, because right now, it's not set from k equals 0 to infinity. Um, so let me show you first just resetting it, how we would reset it. And then I'll give you another option of how you could do it that you wouldn't have to reset it if you want to do it that way. So if we reset it, it means I need to figure out what in the world happens when k is equal to 1. So when k is equal to 1, we are supposed to have, or we, or sorry, we do have, um, a 36 and we have 1 over 100. So my A1 is actually 36 over 100, right? And that makes sense. If, I mean, if you look back at the, the sequence that we wrote it out, that's the first term. It's 36 over 100. So if I want to reset this so that it's k equals 0, I can make that my A term. So it's 36 over 100 as A. And then I have the 1 over 100 to the power of n, and it's from n equal, or k equal, I still did it as n, didn't I? k, um, from k equals 0 to infinity. So you can simply find out what the first term should be of the sequence, and then you can reset that way. Okay, so now if I plug in k equal to 0, I get the 36 over the 100. So this one right here happened from here, but now if I plug in a equal to 0, I'll get that same 36 over 100 that I was getting when I plugged in 1 before. Okay? So for part B, what we would do is we're actually able to do the summation, the S, 
which is a over 1 minus r. So the a value that we end up having is actually that 36 over the 100. And the denominator is 1 over 1 minus, I'm sorry, 1 minus 1 over 100. Um, lots of things we could do to clean up, perhaps. I kind of like getting rid of the double fractions to start with, so I'll multiply by 100. This would give me 36 over 100 minus 1, and I have 36 over 99. That's the most direct way to deal with not having it set to be uh, k equals or a uh, k equal zero at the beginning instead of starting k equal to one. Any questions on that? I'm confused as to why you can put in k sub one or like whatever you put it into the zero. Mm -hmm. So I didn't put it in. I put it in with an accommodation. So you know how when you solve equations, you're able to add something to one side as long yeah. as you accommodate for it by adding it to the other side? That's equivalently what we have done. Okay. So we've changed the starting point to be A1. We've just relabeled. And we've put that A1 in here as 36 over 100, and we've accommodated before it by calling this k equals 0 instead of k equals 1 to infinity. Okay. So if we were to write out the first three or four terms of each of these sequences, they'd match. They're just starting at a different place because they're starting at a different A value at the beginning. All right? So if you, if you also multiply it by A2, would you start at A1? Yeah, like if my, um, like you could do the same thing on this. I, I think this is what you're asking, Adeline, is that if you had been given at the beginning, say, point zero zero nine like this, or nine's not a great number, how about we do eight at least, eight like this, um, and so it started at k equal, in this case it would start at k equal 2 or 3. You could do the same thing. You just figure out what's the k value at 2 or 3, whichever one it was, and then you'd reset that to be the 0 at the beginning by using that value and as the a, the a value at the start. Okay, and a value would just like be really large. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. Okay. Either really large or really small, depending on the values you're working with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right, let's take a look at a couple more. How are we doing on time? Not too bad. All right, properties of infinite series. So there's some properties of infinite series, and they work just like you would expect them to work. Series are actually pretty nice um, because they're based inside of limits, so they follow a lot of our limit um, processes that are intuitively what we wish they were as well. So if we have a sub n and b sub n are convergent series, that's important. And a, b, and c are real numbers. Summation of a sub n is a, summation of b sub n is b. Then if we have a constant multiplier, c times a sub n, we can essentially pull the c in front, and we have the summation of the a sub n's, which is a. Okay, we do this with derivatives, we do this with limits, we just move constant multipliers to the front of everything, and we do everything else the same that it was before. Um, we also do step two, the same thing with uh, limits and derivatives, right? When we find the summation of two sequences, we can just find the summation of each one of the sequences and then add them together. So what we do with derivatives, so what we do with limits, okay? All these things work sort of intuitively the way that we would expect. So when we take, oh, yes, go ahead. What's that different on R? That's real numbers. And so um, when they put that double line on it, like we talk about in Calc 1, okay. it's for real numbers. So it's just telling us that it's in the real numbers. Okay. Yeah. I've never seen it before. Yeah. Yep. Real numbers. A lot of times when, they, when we write it, we just write it with the double line on the left, like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what Yeah, it's just the font that the computer's using. That's all. Nothing different. Okay, so we have one that's summation, right? It's a difference, actually, subtraction. But we have two pieces, and we can separate them into two, separate, two, into two separate series. So I have k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over 2 to the k, and it's subtraction, and I have k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over 3 to the k. 
You don't really have very many tools yet. In fact, you have exactly two. Geometric series and telescoping series. Each of these are separate series. We're going to find each of their series values separately. What kind of series are each of these going to be? You need a 50-50 shot. Oh, are they telescoping or are they geometric first? They're geometric. They are geometric, okay? So they are geometric, and you're right, Zach, they're also convergent. Um, so let's go through all the steps we need to to show that it, that it does that. So how can we see that these are geometric? I mean, they're not exactly in the right form. Could I change them just slightly to see the form a little bit better? Yes. Yeah, it could. So if I go from k equals 0 to infinity, what would the first value, like a, be? 1. It's 1, right? What's my ratio? R. It's supposed to look like this, yeah? What goes inside here? Two. Close. One half. One half. Now, don't overthink it. Um, I know it doesn't look like that the, the one on the top is raised to the power of k, but what is one to the k? One. It's one. So it's okay that we pull the k out because that, that exponent doesn't affect the one as the numerator. Um, I can do the exact same thing over here with the second one. I have one, I have one third to the k. So, based on this new rewritten part, why are these going to converge? Because r is less than one and it's greater than zero. Yep, because the r value, you don't even necessarily have to put it inside of absolute values if you don't want to. Is the r value, both of them actually, right, the one half and the one third, are trapped between zero and one. So they're both going to converge. So I can find each of these individual um, sums, and then I can subtract them because it's a subtraction problem. So I have a, so that's one, over one minus one half. And I'm going to subtract that, um, or subtract from that, a again, the second a, which is one over one minus one-third. So this is one over one-half minus one over two-thirds. So what is one divided by one-half? Two. two. And one divided by two-thirds? Three-halves. And what is two minus three-halves? One-half. This converges to one-half. Um, and it's probably worth saying you can also converge to something's negative. We haven't had one, but this easily could have shown up to I me. Mean, if I'd switched the order right, I would have had a negative value of this converge to. That's perfectly fine as well. Okay, we have our third test inside of this um, section today. The third test talks about what happens um, when you have converging sequences. So the limits of the nth term. If a series converges, then the limit of the sequence a sub n is zero. Notice it's series at the beginning, sequence at the end. If the series converges, the limit of the sequence is zero. That leads to the theorem 9-9, which is what we are going to be using mostly, which is the nth term test for divergence. If the limit of the sequence is not zero, then the series diverges. These are contrapositives of one another. Contrapositives mean that they're logically equivalent. You've negated the second half, so if I negate this limit piece right here at the end of theorem 9-8, it creates the hypothesis for theorem 9-9, and it reverses this as well, right? It negates this converging to this being diverging. This is a great theorem, because sometimes we spin our wheels trying to show if something converges or diverges, and it's actually really, really easy, because the limit of the sequence didn't even equal zero to start with. 
And this should intuitively make sense. So like, um, we'll just look at the next one as an example and just talk about it before we do it. This right here, what is the limit of this sequence? The sequence, 3K over K plus 4, 9.1 stuff. Zero. Nope. I mean, not zero. Not zero. It's infinity. It's, infinity. It, it's not infinity either. It's, it's 3. Why is it 3? Right, it's a rational function. We did some of those last time, right? And the coefficients match. So we happen to have three as the, I'm sorry, not the coefficients, the exponents match. So the coefficient of the numerator is three, the coefficient on the denominator is one, three divided by one is three. The limit of this is three. If you were to look at it on a graph, it would be tapering off at a horizontal asymptote of three, okay? But if I continually add something that's approximately three over and over and forever, it's never going to stop getting larger, right? Yeah, it's going to diverge. It's going to diverge because the only way I have a chance of this working is if that limit of the sequence is zero. Notice, though, what this does not say. This does not say if the limit of the sequence is zero, it converges. That's sort of what we wished it said, but we're going to find out that that does not always work. I can definitely have the limit be zero and it still diverge. So in other words, the converse and the inverse, this is logic talk, the converse and the inverse of these statements don't actually show convergence or divergence. They don't prove anything. They leave us still wondering, I don't know for sure what's happening. But if we have something that the sequence does not go to zero, then we know it diverges. So on this one, the limit of the sequence, namely the 3k over k plus 4, is 3. Right, the limit as k goes to infinity of 3k over k plus 4 is 3. Um, and we did that with more work before. Maybe I'll show it out just as a reminder, right? We want to multiply by the 1 over the k's. We talked about it intuitively, but this one looked like this. So we have 3 over 1 plus 4 over k. That's not a good K. That's better. And this one goes to zero, so we end up with three, right? The limit's three. Could you also just have a little Lipitalis there? Yep, you could use Lipitalis if you want to. That'd be fine, too. Either of those are fine. Um, so what that tells us is, uh, whoops, the summation from K equal one to infinity of three K over K plus four diverges, and any time you're telling what you're, you're deciding, diverges or converges, you need to say how you know. I mean, like we've written part of why we know, this limit business or whatever, but there's a theorem that utilizes those pieces of information. And so you can cite it as theorem 9-9 if you want, but this is the nth term test for divergence. And we can also approximate it as the divergence test if you want. There is only one of them. So this is the divergence test. By the divergence test, this is going to diverge. Divergence test can never tell you something converges. And you're going to want it to. And you're not going to be able to do it.